Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the San Francisco Playhouse. Woo-hoo! If it was a regular show, I'd be standing up on the stage and you would all cheer. Because probably of you watching the show tonight, as there are in an audience, so it's like having a full house. I feel like I have a full house. At any rate, welcome to our empathy gym. We like to think of ourselves as our community's empathy gym, where we come to practice our powers of compassion uh, by entering the experiences of the actors through the play. We turn words into living flesh, and we hopefully go back out into our community to make it a more compassionate place. I'm also very, very proud and honored, honored to be uh, doing my performance, at least, and I think probably our guests' performance on the land that the Ohlone lived on long ago and for many hundreds of years in the Bay Area. It's an honor to be on the land that these great humans pioneered and settled long before uh, the white man came, long before uh, the conquest uh, of, the, uh, of the European powers. And so I just like to thank the Ohlone for, for stewarding this land for such a long and beautiful time. Um, so we've been having wonderful chats week after week with uh, some of America's America's greatest playwrights, and I'm very thrilled to to have uh, such a playwright on the show tonight, whose work has been premiered at the Magic Theater, where some of you may have seen uh, her work, also at the Classical Theater of Harlem and at, at uh, Off Broadway, and many many uh, many many opportunities Off Broadway. She's a playwright I've long admired, admired, but have not yet been able to stage on our stage. Looking forward to that happening very soon. I'd like to welcome Betty Shemea. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi, Bill. How are you? I am fantastic. It's nice to be on the same coast with you. Um, yes. And... Welcome to the San Francisco Playhouse. Thank but you. But you're, you're a local girl. Yes, I am. I grew up in Daly City. And I uh, and moved to San Carlos as a teenager, so this is home for me. Where you are for now, but I you've been in, York, been all yes. sorts of places. I've been in New York for uh, a couple of decades now, but I I'm, I've always considered myself bicoastal. Um, but San Francisco is a very special and important place to me, and my extended, very large Arab American community. It's here, yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, welcome. I, 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 in preparation for our conversation, I read your amazing essay in HowlRound, which I just was, I thought it was just incredible for so many reasons. And I, I wanted to ask you a couple things about it just to start things going. Your first, the first paragraph I think was so profound and I thought, Boy, that is so right. And I don't know who, who is a playwright or actor or producer of color has really put it, put it quite that way before. Um, I want to get it up here sure. and um, read just a tiny bit of it, but my phone shut down. And what it says is, do you mind if I do this, if I quote you? No, I would love okay. that. Okay, okay. It's a HowlRound thing. Welcome everyone from HowlRound, by the way, because we're actually streaming nationally with the amazing platform of HowlRound, which those of you who are not theater people don't know that HowlRound is a sort of a clearinghouse for everything theatrical and all sorts of people post on it and essays. I had one of my Empathy Gym newsletters on HowlRound once and it was a thrill to be on it and, and, and an honor to be sharing our Empathy Gym broadcast with HowlRound. Um, this, is what I, this is what Betty wrote, and I'm going to read it to you because I thought it was so profound and I just, and so correct, so correct. Uh, the debt that is owed to the black artists, thinkers, and intellectually by we non-black Americans of color is so immense and multi-layered it cannot be quantified. They've given us the language of revolution, integrated all white institutions, and modeled how to rise to the apex of power in America. Overwhelmingly, black pioneers have embraced and accepted other people of color as allies, all while knowing they bear the brunt of both microaggressions in artistic spaces 
and the murderous violence necessary to keep a racist society in place, especially when we keep our little mouths shut. I thought that was so beautiful. Thank so you you're good that. in prose, too. <laughs> well, I guess I, I think I would say that I'm fiery and I think that the role of the playwright is to be an intellectual as well and to look at our industry, but also the world. And I think, um, I think actually the legacy of McCarthyism has kind of hobbled many playwrights' ability to you know, feel like that it's very important to engage with social issues and, you know, and agitate and provoke, not just in our work. So I, f I kind of feel like the legacy of McCarthyism, like the kind of fear of engaging with the hot button political issues of our time has infected a lot of playwrights. And I'm, not, I'm sure a lot of them feel many of the sentiments that I articulated in that essay. But I think, um, you know, I don't know who said it and I don't know about who they said and I wanted to research it, but somebody said, told the basketball player, shut up and dribble um, when he was engaging with um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. I, you know, right. And and I kind of feel like it's like shut up and write plays, you know, um, but I'm very excited about artists like Tony Kushner or John Janae who really uh, engage uh in in the political arena and kind of like you know are are there in body and spirit as well as in their theater work because you know i think it's i think it's exciting and important and i think this time you know we're we're, we're kind of reckoning with all these ideas um is you know it's it's a, it, fe it feels important and it also feels like this is what we're supposed to do as artists and intellectuals. We're supposed to interrogate how we are uncomfortable. You know, I mean, what I articulate in the essay also is my own complacency right. in kind of modeling how one as an artist of color represents a whole community and kind of takes the lion's share of focus as long as you kind of stay within the strictures of, of not being too political or not being... Uh, you know, too bombastic in your work, you kind of are rewarded for that. And, and I think part of my journey as a, as a writer and an artist and a thinker and a person is to interrogate how have I participated or um, uh, gained from the structures of American theater as they currently are. It's very easy to point fingers at other people. And I, you know, have certainly had my difficulties in, you know, I'm much more widely produced in Europe. And that's, I think problematic and um, uh, interesting also because for most of my life, America has been at war in the Middle East in some fashion. And um, part of the legacy of, like I said, McCarthyism um, is that we haven't inherited the 60s kind of awareness of war, possibly because most middle class people are not drafted. So even though we are at war, there's this kind of feeling that it's not happening and it's not real because it's not happening to a certain sector of society and not everybody's vulnerable. So, you know, it's very strange to be, to know that war is going on and people are dying on both sides and you kind of live in this bubble that in the sixties you didn't live in. You didn't have the comfort of not confronting the Vietnam war and what it meant. Um, so yeah, that, so that's something, you know, this, this movement, um, it's very important for me to kind of continually investigate how I, as an artist, can push push the industry, our our beloved industry. And I think nobody comes into theater trying to, you know, um, diminish uh, other people. I mean, I, I say it a lot. I say it almost every time I speak. I've worked in enough cultural context to know that theater people, I have more in common with anybody who works in theater than somebody from my culture who doesn't love words that the, we're our own tribe and and you know and part of being part of a tribe is that we make our tribe better just like part of being a family is calling out how we can become better um and and not just pointing fingers but also looking inward and that's what i was really trying to do you know with the last kind of decade of my career uh which is you know working with more um you know theaters that had uh, less less of the money and the exposure that I was used to working with because they were willing to do the kind of work that I really felt I was wanted to do. Um, so thank you for reading my essay or part of it. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs>
Yeah, that's great. I, I'm kind of fascinated by your comment about McCarthyism because mm -hmm. we think of McCarthyism as of being, uh, you know, literally 70 years ago, a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of great American writers were, careers were destroyed by McCarthyism mm -hmm. forever. Some came back 20, 30 years later, you know, Waldo Salt, people like that, screenwriters in particular, but playwrights as well, mm -hmm. whose careers were ruined. And we think, of course, of, of, of a play like The Crucible, which Arthur Miller wrote in a de denunciation of McCarthyism. So, so it's interesting because I guess I sort of thought, oh, we're done with that. That's mm -hmm. the, the battles we're fighting now are, are different battles, but I think I'm going to think about that because in a way the threat of suppression actually happening in this country in regards to con artistic content or the political affiliations of artists is I think probably still pretty real. Well, I mean, they're real also in our minds, even the idea. Yeah, that's the exactly. The concept of political theater doesn't exist in Europe in the same way. In that, uh, you know, and for, first of all, even the word political, for me, it has somebody who's kind of a BSer, somebody who kind of, you know, fudges the truth. To be political to me is not a compliment. When you, so when people are like, oh, you write political theater, I always hear it as you write things that <laughs> ameliorate. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but it all, that, that, term was coined during the McCarthyism era and does not exist in other contexts. You know, the idea that, and, and, and what is also troubling is, you know, I didn't get in this industry to write plays about Arab Americans who've lived in the last decades that I've been alive. I got in because I'm interrogating and trying to deal with the human condition. And I think sometimes when you are of a certain race, people label you as, you know, dealing with political issues. Um, when everybody's dealing with political issues, it's just, uh, you know, it's just how we see it is, is meaning non-mainstream or non-white or non. Right. And the other thing that's very important for me is who gets to be white changes. For example, Eugene O'Neill, you know, was writing at a time when there wasn't, you know, when a Kennedy was a dream, you couldn't have a Catholic president. Um, and, you know, A Long Day's Journey Into Night is to me the classic immigrant play about poverty and about uh, the kind of how you are haunted by class, even when you no longer belong to that class. And, you know, it, and I feel like that could be a black story, that could be a, a, an Arab story. And, and one of the things that I feel that's exciting about this movement is, is who gets to be universal may, the, the concept will be may be expanded by this kind of you know real reckoning with um because i believe that you know you can't understand understand o'neill unless you understand the irish american experience just like you can't understand august wilson uh, unless you understand the african american experience so and, yet, and you don't need to understand them at all at all in terms of you know when my play the black guide was done in greece you know, it was like the easiest production of my entire universe. They called me up and said, let me fly you to Greece for the opening. It was like, I didn't have to have any conversations. They picked up the script and they did it. And so I went there expecting for them to want to talk about, you know, the black eyed is about four Palestinian women across the ages. There's a suicide bomber. I mean, it's, it's intense political stuff. So I thought that they were very political political in that term and that they were going to talk to me about the Middle East. They didn't ask, you know, the whole week that I was there, they didn't ask me one question about anything except the character's internal motivations, nothing about the Middle East, nothing about war or violence or all the things that, that, uh, that play is known to be dealing with. And I took the producer aside and I said, why would you do a play? You know, your economy is going to hell in Greece about four Palestinian women. And she said, we saw it as a play about four strong people. We never, like, we know that they're of an ethnicity, but we know it in the way that you would know O'Neill is about Irish people. It's also right. about, you know, uh, addiction and, and uh, class and all the other things. And it was shocking to me that even I kind of absorbed that idea of how it was being 
perceived and thought that that's how it's going to be perceived throughout the world. And that's what I mean about the legacy of McCarthyism, because he kind of divided art into political and non-political, which means dangerous to the status quo and not. The, those terms didn't exist in how you talked about art before that era. So that's and I think that that stays with us. And not only does it affect how producers see us, it affects how audiences see I mean, artists see ourselves, which is, I think, the much more pernicious and fascinating and um, difficult right. thing to deal with, mm -hmm. you know. So I had an expectation that they were going to talk about my play in the way that that play is talked about in America. And they did the play because they thought the characters were fascinating and fun and sexy and complicated. And so and I didn't have that same experience, you know, in this, in this, I feel very post McCarthy era of talking about plays as universal or, or non universal specific or, you know, universal, like I said. So oh. I, I think, but I also think, you know, one of the things about life is that we're continually changing and the theater industry is changing. And, and I think we can either, be freaked out by it, you know, like as I was when I had to start working with smaller theaters and, and with people who uh, uh, were newer in the game in some ways, or we can kind of embrace it. And, and it's sometimes unexpectedly wonderful things, the kind of the results that you want working in the way that you think is going to happen is actually the opposite of what you need to be doing as an artist um, or person in the world. So that's been, that's been my experience <laughs> so far. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm I'm 100% with you. I mean, this is interesting because I I have often said that I don't really feel that theater, at least the theater that I embrace, my own. I don't I don't criticize anyone for doing anything they want to do. You know, I mean, the San Francisco Mime Troupe is a avowedly political theater. Right. Right. But I I don't I'm not interested in uh, espousing a political position mm -hmm. or trying to convince someone to hold a point of view that I hold. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just not, I'm interested in trying to get people to identify with a position that they don't understand. Yeah. You know, they have the whole just walking a mile in somebody's shoes that they didn't think they could ever be in, you know? Yeah. So I'm always looking for, I, I, I agree with you. I'm looking for stories that resonate that are from specific ethnic sources, whether it be Italian Americans or uh, Palestinian Americans or Chinese Americans or Black Americans or Indian Americans, like Yoga Play. I mean, there's a play that play is 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 about a specific ethnic groups, absolutely, and about the appropriation of of culture, and yet it's completely universal. We all completely get that. Everyone does. And that's what I'm always searching for is stories that stories that that may be embedded in a in a specific, you know, racial community, but they resonate for everyone. You know? Yes. And and one of the ways that I've really, you know, after the Great Depression, the only people only wanted to write comedies. And I feel like I'm in a space where I really think how we reach each other is to laugh together and, <laughs> and laugh at ourselves and laugh at each other and, you know, and laugh at the human condition. So I'm really, uh, and it's something that, that most people who have seen Roar or the Black Eyed or Territories would not expect from me. And I, it's, but I think it's, it kind of, it's a knee jerk reaction. It happened after, like I said, the Great Depression that, that people really wanted to to find ways to laugh. And, and that's very exciting to me. I think that, you know, I don't know. I think comedy does something to us that is so exciting. And if you can laugh with each other, then, then you can get through anything. And, and the thing about laughter is it, it's the great equalizer. You know, wit is is the way to make anybody see that not only are you walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, you're actually in their shoes and you didn't even notice because we're all in the same shoes. So I I'm I'm really excited about, you know, the opportunities to because I grew up, you know, and everyone says, Oh, you know, this live streaming theater, it's terrible, it's this and it's that. 
I grew up a world away from Broadway. You know, I saw a few productions of ACT as a kid, you know, uh, but how I came to the theater is I listened to cassettes at the Daly City Library. And there were wonderful cassettes of not even um, musicals, but plays and on my little Walkman. And, and what I'm encouraging people who are frustrated with the lack of theater is to listen to plays. Like, like we're writing blueprints kind of like symphonies. And we, we're not a, you know, and, I, and, I, and not everybody in the theater wants to hear this, but I'm like, we're, we can't compete 100% with, with the visual medium of film, but we can certainly compete with, you know, opera. And, and I feel like I understood theater from listening to those plays. So, you know, I'm really encouraging people to, to support the theaters and see these plays, but also understand you can listen to them if, if, it's, if it's very stressful or, or it doesn't feel as compelling to watch because that's how I got introduced to theater. And I think that, and the reason I mentioned that is because is because we all are isolated and, and, you know, especially, you know, how, how I get energy is to go see, uh, somebody told me, you know, Edward Albee was in Texas for a long time. And a friend of mine was also there where he was teaching. I don't remember which university, but he was in residence for a long time. And they say he went and saw everything, everything that was happening in, I think it was Houston. He saw whether the big or the small, and that's the kind of artist I am. I like to sit in a theater I'll sit in a college production. I'll sit in a high school production. I'll sit in a theater that's aesthetic. I have a problem with, and you know, I, I you know, or politically, you know, I'll sit in theaters, you know, to mean that I'm like, what the hell are you doing with this much money? You know, like, but just the chance to be in a theater is very exciting for me. But I do think we can gain so much by listening to these productions, and I'm excited to see what SF Playhouse is going to do with with this opportunity because it also in some ways equalizes the experience in the way that, you know, me sitting in Daly city find stumbling upon these, these plays, you know, being able to listen to the Dulces of Malfi and Shakespeare plays on little cassettes gave me access to a world that I might not have otherwise. And so maybe this time we'll be giving, you know, young female artists of color like me who are sitting in libraries or streaming a chance to engage in a way that, that, or in a way that they can't till they're older and have more resources than I, than I had. So, so I'm excited about what this is going to do to our community. I, I have, I have no doubt we are going to continue to survive and thrive and, uh, you know, and, but I, you know how we work may have to morph like my last few commissions have been have been university theaters and I think they've kind of uh you know they pay me to come teach for a semester and and write basically but you know teach one class a week not uh, have full on loan and I I kind of feel like it's the Medici's of our time you know like how we do theater and how we fund it has to change um and that's terrifying but it's it is what it is and we've You've got to, uh, you know, embrace it. <laughs> well, the foundations, the foundations of real are really shifting their shifting their Absolutely. focus towards the development of young playwrights of color. I mean, just been, I think most of the foundations that support playwriting are just that's all they're doing. Um, you know, I, 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 I see. But here's the thing: I feel like, and and what I kind of tried to delineate in the essay. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, there weren't black people on the stage. I think it was Joseph Papp who put them in Shakespeare, you know, and then it turned into this system where, you know, and I'm not speaking about SF Playhouse, but in New York, it felt like every off Broadway did one artist of color. Yeah. And if you did Betty, you certainly weren't going to do another Middle Eastern or Indian or African American in your season. So you were competing for that one slot. Right. Every the other person of color. You described so, it as being the chosen one. Exactly. And you and, and the chosen yeah. one has to beat out all the other messiahs <laughs> and make it to the cross and get nailed. You know, it'd be like you have you know, you get to but you're competing for that one slot. So yeah. I, I feel like what is happening now is kind of um uh not a correction, but a kind of you know, this is also happening when most theaters are shut down. 
And, right. and so, you know, really what huge advantage and my, my deep hope. And, and that's kind of what I got tried to get into, you know, in the, do we see ourselves essay is that it isn't about, because there have always been artists of color in the last 20 years, but are they the artists who are really um, challenging audiences? You know, uh, you know, I don't think if you're, if you're a theater and you suddenly do the, the same artist of color that you've been doing for the last 20 years, that's not, you know, it's, 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 um, it doesn't, well, it's, it's I, like, a, it's like kind of a game. It's like, well, who's going to be our, our, who's going to be our playwright of color this year? Kind of right. That, that's, absolutely. that's been a classic example of the way American theater has tended to work. Yeah, even yeah. women. I mean, when I was, the Lily Awards came out, you know, when I, I right. moved to New York, it was the year, like, I think Playwrights Horizon had no women uh, uh, playwrights and one female director, and it ignited the Lily Awards. So I think that maybe that is kind of how integration of institution happens, you know, now, but what it started happening was you used to have to have that one female playwright. You know what I mean, and so if you did a, 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 a female of color, you hit both of them, and then you didn't have to worry about being tagged as the off Broadway theater that had no women, or you know. So, right. so it's not just about race; it becomes about it becomes about how do you prevent yourself? How do you do the minimum uh, so that you're not targeted? Which, you know, theater is very hard. You know, it's hard to make. It's hard to 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 live and 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 I think the idea that we're always going to get it right you know like I say in the essay I did things and I put out plays in certain orders because I was trying to do things right and it actually ended up being wrong but the idea that we all have to be right all the time and that we can't evolve and grow uh is something that I think is detrimental to us as a community because I believe we are a community we're weirdos we are weirdos we <laughs> put lights on and then we have people pretend that they're real and everybody's quiet. You know, do you know how hard it is to get people to shut up like at a dinner party or just listen your, to you? But we, we like making people shut up and listen and pretend things are real. I mean, if you think about it, if like an alien came down and saw the things that we do with our lives and our emotions and our careers, they'd be like, who are these strange people? There's no evolutionary function to this. So we are a community. And, and I think that, that we have to, you know, grow together like any family, because that's how I feel about the American family. You know, for a long time, I mean, it's very, very to be produced, to be in an, in a society that says and and applies for grants, saying we we believe in diverse writers, and having to go to Europe to get major productions of world premieres for over a decade. That's pain, deeply painful because I feel like a daughter of the American theater. And so, so when you're, you're the, when you're the stepchild or you're, when you're the, you know, child who's not uh, embraced, it's painful. And I think that some of what is happening in our theater is, is, is deep, deep pain, you know, uh, and, and I certainly feel it and felt it and, and how I dealt with it, being the stubborn person that I am was find different ways to create theater here you know, whereas most people I think would have packed it up and moved to London a long time ago in my, you know, in my position, uh, because it was so much easier, but I'm stubborn and I'm American and I believe my voice should be heard here. And basically I'm stubborn, but, <laughs> but I do think we have, we have to grow together. We have to fail together. We have to fail better. We have to become an industry that says, okay, we're going to do that one play, right? Uh, okay, maybe maybe let's let's interrogate that. Maybe let's tip the scales and then feel like we have to do performatively only young female playwrights of color, and let's tip it back. And you know, we we are gonna self correct. Do you have is there a doorbell? <laughs> no, you'd never, no, you'd never mind. Yeah. Okay, but do you we know how when Amazon comes, they ring the doorbell. Yes, you don't have to oh. go there because they've just put a package by your door. God, yay, Amazon. Um, I guess I'm uh, or, to using Amazon, so it's like, <laughs> well, I'm confessing. I, I confess. Uh, you know, you know uh, 
I was thinking you're that, outing yourself, Bill. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I find myself nationally on how. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, it's okay. So um, humiliating. I, but I well, was thinking, if is there are there ways in which you could articulate, be open about this? Are I because I think there, it's interesting the the difference between being an Arab American playwright and being a Black American playwright. Because there is so much enmity for the for Arab states in the <laughs> Middle East, don't you? Do you think that that's? Could you be? Could well, you be I, a little bit more specific about why you think it is you have to take your place to Europe? Oh, Bill, I was not trying to take my place to Europe. European theaters were finding me. Were yeah, interested? Yeah. You know what I mean? And well, and well, but I mean, why you think that the the America why that happened? Um. I think why it happened was um, uh, what I tried to allude to was I, when I wrote plays like Roar, which were not deeply challenging, which were Arab on Arab violence, which didn't kind of interrogate what it felt like to grow up in a place like San Francisco and know that people were deeply racist um, and felt justified in feeling racist against your people but like you personally, and that's been my experience. Like right. people, it, you know, what I say about people like Obama is they see him as, as exceptional, meaning he's the exception to the rule that black men are this way. So they're exceptional. The rule doesn't have to change. So I, you know, grew up in what everyone feels is a liberal society, you know, where it's okay to act like Arabs don't need human rights or that, you know, I mean, the reasons we went to war in the Middle East uh, and, and the reasons the democratic and, uh, you know, liberal and artists did not rise up in the way that they did in the 60s to say, what are we doing and why and what is it costing us, you know, is deeply painful. And the only way I could understand it is, you know, to be have grown up in Delhi City with wonderful neighbors who loved me, who spent every holiday making block parties with my family who were deeply racist and uh, afraid. And, and also I went to a small Catholic school called Our Lady of Mercy in Daly City um, where we had a nun who would make us jump under the desks and you know cover our heads because she thought that the Russians were coming. So as a child, I had nightmares that the Russians were coming to get me. And when 9-11 happened, I was in New York. That was my first year actually in New York. Um, and I realized, oh, no, there's going to be little kids who think, you know what I mean, that it's going to be scary to go drive on bridges. Because that's in that's how, you know, we thought it was going to happen in 9-11, that, that, that there were going to be more attacks. And, you know, it was a crazy, crazy time. But but I, I within my relatively short lifetime, the fear of being killed by atomic bomb was turned to the, the fear of terrorism. And, and mm, you know, uh, you know. So, so I understood intimately, you know, and uh, I understood intimately what that fear looked like because I had that instilled in me in it as an Arab girl growing up in Delhi City against another race that I, of people I had never met. And so, um, so I, think, I think what happened is I started really trying to engage and challenge audiences because I had done plays like Roar, which, you know, Roar is, many people think it's my best play. It's, it's a well-made play. It's my version of a streetcar. You know, a sexy aunt comes and kind of messes up a household uh, and, and then she leaves. Uh, so it's, uh, and streetcar is one of my favorite plays in the universe. So, um, but it's also not a deeply challenging play. And, and, and I was very considered in what plays I showed when in my career. And what I thought would happen, which was, you know, people would postpone indefinitely productions of Roar that um, were all slated for their seasons. Or, you know, I would get, you know, emails that said, we really want your play, but we feel like you might be, you know, challenging or, uh, uh, you know. So what kind of happened was I feel like a little bit that my career, once I started to saying, okay, I've shown you that I have the chops to do a well-made play. Now let me talk about things that are really on my mind and interesting and in experimental ways. There wasn't room for that in the culture. Um, at, 
And, and this is also to say, there wasn't room for that in the culture of the Yale School of Drama model of how you make plays, which is you go off Broadway and you become the chosen one. So when that was how I understood how to become a playwright. And had I not, I might have stayed in San Francisco, where I have a huge, loving, wonderful community and family. I had a model for how you succeed. And it didn't work for me the minute right. I stepped off the path of um, there was creating a place that had pre been presented to you as a part of the American dream. Exactly. You write the play which expresses your ethnicity but does not challenge the status quo. Absolutely. It kind of fits in to the game. Right. And then that's that that is how I think, you know, many people grow up. I you know, of course, I think that San Francisco Playoffs has basically begun with the idea of challenging audiences. You know, we it's a big part of what we do. And I think the audience, the audiences that we have want to be challenged. But, you know, how much do they want to be challenged? You know, like I have to look, <laughs> at, I mean, I look at myself too. And I like in the same way you're talking about, in the same way you're talking about with having to look at that the sort of falseness of that approach, you know, that you weren't being as honest about what you had in your heart to say as you could have been. I wonder, I'm still processing so much, you know, but as a theater leader, I think what is my job right now, you know, and I guess I still think it's to find stories which live embedded in a, in a community, but which still speak to everyone. Yes, absolutely. And, but, and, 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 uh, you know, I have such empathy for, for people like you who have devoted your lives to creating institutions like the SF Playhouse. And, uh, you know, cause, cause they deserve to survive and thrive. And, uh, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge and it's a service. And, you know, uh, I, I'm very excited about the next chapter. I'm excited to see what your season will bring. Um, and, uh, yeah. You know, I, I think of, I've all, I often describe, uh, when I talk to people about playwriting I often describe playwrights as the prophets of our time because there's never been a play in the history of theater that didn't succeed in its own time I, I had a history theater professor tell me that my freshman year in college and I said oh come on there must be a play that wasn't discovered for a couple hundred years or like you know like artists right like yeah, Van yep. Gogh, like all mm -hmm. so many great artists and novelists and composers they just, the, the, they're ahead of their time and they don't get noticed until they're dead. But that just isn't mm -hmm. true of playwrights. It's never, ever happened. And I, I tried to prove him wrong and I couldn't. Because, <laughs> because a, play, a play is by necessity of the moment. The moment that it's happening in front of the people that are being done for, who live in the world they live in, the playwrights are people with more sensitive antenna that can pull down information out of the tumult that the rest of us are missing and translate it into some into a story that can help us see ourselves. That's really what I believe about about plays and about playwriting. And I so I the challenge to you, of course, here we are in a pandemic, in, in a <laughs> pandemic and a revolution, right? Mm -hmm. In the American theater. What's the prophecy? You know, <laughs> what what do people need to hear? What what are you thinking about that not even necessarily a plot, but a way of telling a story? Or what are people gonna when we come out back out to the theater, what do we need? Um well here's something I've been advocating for for a decade. And that is theater, uh, we cannot compete with film or live streaming, nor should we try to. 
the people who are going to be attracted to theater are people who love the live experience. And that may be a limited audience. And that may be dependent upon the kindness of universities in the way that we were dependent on the kindness of Medici's in the... Um, but I think something that is, is really important to me is that we continue to look for stories that can only exist or exist best in the theatrical form. Um, and that means how and who and for whom we make plays. You know, we, you know, theater used to be the center of the culture. That's how Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller became household names. Their plays became movies that, that movie stars did. But, but the idea of a well-made play or a, a family drama was really an important component of what made American theater American, as opposed to, you know, the craziness of Sartre or Genet or, you know, or Beckett. Um, and I, I, I think that, we, you know, we need new forms, you know, but we, we need to also kind of embrace our, our weirdness and our theatricality and, and the kinds of plays we produce are going to be different because I think the kind of well-made sort of situation is, has been taken over by film and, and streaming. So I think that mm -hmm. theater will never die. There will always be people who, who need and like me and love that live experience, who get energy out of sitting in a room with a hundred people or 20 people and laughing at an actual comedy that's live, that's precarious, that somebody may fall down. Um, so I think the thing is that we need to have hope. We, and, and the other thing is who is more adept at surviving than theater people? Who is more adept at improvising? Who is more adept at making something out of nothing than us? So I have a lot of hope and excitement, I, but I think one of the things we need to do is really embrace our, our opportunity to be more engaging politically, artistically, uh, than other forms and be at the forefront of intellectual thought. I think I think um, that um, the theater yeah. by its very nature is 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 danger, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like we're doing an interview and we didn't plan this out, we didn't have Absolutely. an outline. There's a spirit of danger because we could get in a big fight over something, you know, who knows? <laughs> we could we could we could we could have said anything, you know, and yes. people don't know what we're gonna say, right? Yes. There's that spirit of danger, even in this Absolutely. even in this interchange. Uh, but I think in theater, that spirit of danger is, I think, what is essentially theatrical because it can you don't know that it will go right. You don't know <laughs> what will happen because we all know it can go wrong or it could go. Uh, it, it could go off the rails or we don't really know what's coming up next. And I think that's what you're saying about the well-made play. I think the time of the well-made play has come and gone. I think it's now it's time for un, unwell-made plays oh, oh. or plays which, are, which, which we don't know how they're going to go. We don't know what this character is going to do. We don't have any idea what this motherfucker is going to do. <laughs> and I see that on national television, howl around. It's you know, we just all don't the way know. around. That's, to me, that's the thing that draws me the most is when I start reading a play and I have no idea what these people are going to do, but I can't stop reading, right? Or I can't stop watching because they're so focused on who they are and what they're doing that I just have to follow them so that I can find out what they're going to do, you know? Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that's, um, you know, when I was coming out of drama school, everyone was like, who's the protagonist in your play? Who's the protagonist? You know? And they, they had this idea that there's one person who, who's, I, who, and I, and I don't know if it's because I come from a Middle Eastern tradition or because I really like to mess with that. There's not one person sure. who gets whose story it gets to be. You've got to give everybody their moment. And you know, the reviews of Roar are like, first I thought it was the daughter, and then I thought it was the mom, and then you realize it's actually the aunt, you know. And I was like, what is this need to make one person, you know, so even that's an explosion of the idea of this is Willie Loman's story or this is Blanche's story. That's you know, that's that's or this is, you know, um, 
uh, Mary's story and in, in a long day's journey. You know, like I think even that is 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 a way to kind of poke holes in the idea of right. because you don't know who's going to how you're going to feel about these people and who you're going to end up liking. And it may not be the person you're supposed to like or supposed to care about. Um, so even in that way, I think uh, theater can uh, dislocate an American audience who's used to, you know, there's one person whose story I'm following and, and this is the person I identify with. And I'm so excited. I'm really excited about the, the theater that's going to come out of this time. Um, and, you know, for me as a playwright, it usually takes 18 months to find, to write a play. And so, you know, six months of sitting, being holed up, that seems about normal to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, seems about right. I'm sure the directors and actors. You know, know I've had a lot, of, a lot of your colleagues, a lot of your playwright colleagues have said that on this very show. They say, <laughs> hey, I stay home. I write. I stare at the wall. This is no big deal. Absolutely. This is not so different, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, wow. Well, that was, thank you so much for joining me. We went over our usual length a little bit, but I, I think that what you said about, about breaking down the, the protagonist, because that's, that's like Aristotle, right? So that's the very beginning of Western tradition of theater started then in the Greek theater. And then Aristotle said, there is a protagonist. And uh -huh. we all have been for 2,500 years going, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. You're right. Aristotle got to be that way, you know, and I think oh, this is, this is, and it's, you know, the protagonist concept of drama has been getting broken down for some time, but I think, uh -huh. yeah, this is a time to take a look at all of those kind of, you know, assumptions we make about mm -hmm. theater and, and find ways to just rip it up and tear it up and throw it out there in a different way that we can then, you know, see what happens, see what, see what makes it dangerous, you know? Yep. Great. Well, Betty, thank you so much. Thank it's such you, a Bill. pleasure to get to talk to you. And uh, we'll have to, well. since, since we're so far apart, <laughs> you know, I'm in Point Richmond, so I'm just across the bay from you. Okay, we'll, well, have, we'll to, have to have a social we'll distance. Have to meet up, <laughs> we'll have to meet up for a distance coffee at like 12 <laughs> and shout at, at each other or something. Yeah. Oh, one, anyway, all thank right. you for coming. And thank all of you at home in your theater seats, um, um, hopefully with something to eat and something to drink because it's kind of dinner time. that we had scheduled so we're going to put that off uh next week we're going to have fireside cocktails with Susie, and Susie's guest is going to be stacy ross who is a, a legendary san francisco actor and has been on our stage and every other stage in the bay area many many times the really the, the luminous stacy ross will be with Susie, and they will have cocktails uh, you will yeah. find out what that cocktail will be so you can have one too and then the following Monday, we're going to do a play called Two Pigeons Talking Politics. See, here we are, back to politics. The play is called Two Pigeons Talking Politics by Lauren Gunderson. So we'll hope you all tune in for all of these, our weekly TV shows. I never thought I would be in television. And now mm -hmm. I, have, I have two weekly television serieses. So thank you. And thank all of you who, when you bought your free ticket uh, to see this show, made a donation because obviously keeping the theater going is a, is a very challenging problem for us right now. And those of you who contribute both before the show and after when you get the thank you email will be tremendously helpful. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you all of you who tuned in to HowlRound. It's been great uh, sharing this conversation with you. And we hope to see you again real soon. Bye.